Hello, this is Grady Parsons. I'm, uh, this is another in our series of Where Are We Going as a Church? Today I'm turning to a different book for our conversation. This is a book by Peter Steinke, who is a Lutheran minister and noted uh, expert and lecturer on family systems theory. Uh, Peter sort of inherited the mantle from Edwin Freeman when Edwin Freeman died several years ago. And the book I'm referring to from Peter is Congregational Leadership in Anxious Times, being calm and courageous no matter what, uh, a relevant topic for our times uh, in the church. Where I want to start today is, is this whole I issue of, of anxiety and what does it mean? The, uh, Peter talks about that the root word from anxiety is really the word anake, A-N-A-N-K-E, which really means a throat or to press together. And it's, it's the, based on the uh, Greek name for the god of constraint who presided over slavery. Anake was a word used for yokes or rings on, on the necks of slaves. So other parts, other languages that picked up this word, you have the word ang from anger, which is Indo-European, uh, angst from the Old German, from general dread, angra from Old Norse, which is grief, Augustus from Latin, which is anguish, uh, ing from German again, which is narrow, angera fr from Latin, which is to choke or strangle, and, of course, angina, which we know of, which is the tight sensation in the chest that accomplishes uh, pain or, or dread. All of these words are about this whole sense of what anxiety does to us, the effect that anxiety has upon us. Anxiety, we think of as, as a general state of uh, frightfulness or frustration or concern. But the effect of anxiety is this whole sense of restricting who we are and what we can do and what we can be. So some of the behaviors that happen because of anxiety, especially anxiety in a church, is decrease our capacity to learn. We certainly don't want to learn anything more if we're anxious about what we already know. Replace curiosity with the demand for certainty. If we're anxious about what's in front of us, we want to have more certainty about where we're going ahead. Stiffen our position over against another. Anxiety easily creates more conflict because people want to hold on to their positions because they're afraid of the change. Uh, inter interrupts concentration. Obviously, you know, if you've been anxious, trying to concentrate on something is, makes it even more uh, difficult to do. Uh, projects don't get done. Work doesn't get done. You find yourself uh, having driven all your entire uh, commute to work and not seen anything you've looked at because you're anxious about something else. Floods the nervous system so we can't hear other people without disruption or cannot respond with clarity. Uh, anxiety becomes a filter. Uh, not a good filter, but really like a dirty oil filter between ourselves and others that we don't hear what they're saying clearly because we're so full of our own anxiety that we're really not hearing what other folks are saying. It simples ways of thinking into strictly yes and no. It's either my way or your way, your way or my way. Anxiety creates this whole sense that every conversation is a win-lose conversation, a conversation that we must win or something evil will happen to us. It prompts a desire for a quick fix, and this is something that Edwin Freeman always talked about, our addiction in this culture to a quick fix, that any problem that happens, there has to be a quick solution to it in order to make it go away. That's our anxiety, that we're not really patient enough for long-term solutions to problems. So if there's a flood, we want the wall, we want a levee built. If there's a fire, we want new rules about where you can build fires, so all these kinds of things. So anxiety makes us more addicted than ever to a quick fix arouses feelings of helplessness or self-doubt. So if you're anxious, of course, uh, especially if we're anxious about ourselves, we have tremendous sense of foreboding, a tremendous sense that we're not worthy. And in a congregation, this can become especially prevalent that we would develop a whole negative sense of ourselves, of our future, of where we're going and how we're going to be as people, and becomes a real sense of helplessness that we can't do anything about who we are as a church. It leads to an array of defensive uh, behaviors. Uh, if you're anxious, you often don't want to interact with other people or we become really angry with any other people very easily. We don't want to uh, share our toys. Uh, we don't want to share in conversations. We don't want to uh, be in relationships. It diminishes flexibility and response to life's challenges. Again, the whole root word of anxiety is to narrow. So the more anxious we are, the more narrow we are, the more rigid we are about being, so we can't be flexible with what's going on because we think, again, everything is a win-lose. And it creates imagination gridlock, that we're not able to think uh, creatively outside of the, what's right in front of us, that we pretty much are so anxious about 
anything in the future that we can only think about what already is and not even contemplate things being differently. I really want to recommend uh, this book to you, uh, Congregational Leadership in Anxious Times. I found it to be an excellent summary. Uh, those of you who are already familiar with family systems theory will find some parts of it uh, a repeat, but those of you who just know a little bit about it and want to know more will find, I think, it to be a helpful way to engage the topic and to be able to enter into some conversations and begin to see your congregation, maybe even some of your relationships, in a more systematic way instead of individuals and maybe just some ways that are not very healthy. Now, anxiety is, is part of our life in the church because we are people, we live in a culture, uh, especially in a culture right now where the economy is not good. People have lost jobs. There's still lots of diseases that haven't been cured. There's relationships that are fractured in marriages and families. Uh, there's people's whole anxiety about their future, what's going to happen to them, and all these anxieties uh, live out in the church. Some of those we can do something about. Uh, some of those we have some control as to how we relate to. Some of those we can do nothing about. Uh, it's been said that like 60% of what Presbyterian sessions worry about is really not within their control whatsoever. And yet it creates tremendous amounts of anxiety as they try to think about the future of their church. So I guess the first question I'd want to challenge you with is, is are you really anxious about your church? Is that really the truth about who you are and how you feel? Do you have an anxious congregation where these kinds of behaviors are evidence among other people that there's a sense of narrowness or a sense of holding on or a sense of being squeezed by life's uncertainties that so much that they can't really see the future? Uh, what's feeding that anxiety? And well, how can you speak to that anxiety? And how can we as a people of faith uh, move beyond that anxiety or move through that anxiety to be the faithful people who are living in hope? David spoke a lot about anxiety and about anxiousness in the Psalms. So we frequently turn to that. In, in Psalm 142, David says, With my voice I cry to the Lord, and make my, with my voice I make supplication to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before him. I tell my trouble before him. When my spirit is faint, you know my way. So God is not unfamiliar with our anxieties. In fact, God has been dealing with human anxieties from the day one uh, of our creative life on this planet and the anxieties of the whole planet. And I think part of that groaning of creation seeking reorder that we talk about in Romans is the uh, creation wanting to be kind of released from this anxiety we feel in this constant battle of life, of living and dying and trying to be who we are. I guess what I want to encourage you to really to do is to think uh, prayerfully and think uh, deeply and to share with you and your session about what does it mean to lead in an anxious period. That's really what Stanky's book is about. What does it mean to lead when your congregation is anxious? What kind of leadership do they need? What kind of leadership is, are they crying for? It doesn't mean you have to be fake. It doesn't mean you have to suppress all your own concerns. But it does mean that they're looking for leadership that is uh, certain and is calm and is able to be a non-anxious presence in a time when there's much anxiety about. And I want to encourage you to really think about what your role is in that. I also want to encourage you because Peter Steinke is one of our speakers at the Big Tent Conference in Indianapolis in June and the registration is open. And I want to encourage you right now to think about you and your session, or you the members of your church, signing up and coming to Indianapolis the last uh, part of June, the first part of July, to be part of that conference, to share with Presbyterians all across the country in the mission of the church and strengthen each other as we take that mission back to our local congregations. So I hope to see you at Big Tent, and thank you, and we'll talk again.